may be seated. That can come down now, fellas. I want to talk to you tonight. This is a little tenty, so help me out with that a little bit, please. Uh, I want to talk to you. Turn to Genesis chapter number 2. Genesis chapter number 2. Again, like the world does and a lot of unlearned Christians, uh, we tend to assume, make up things that uh, in our mind is not maybe clear. And a lot of times it ends up adding a whole lot of confusion to a whole lot of people who are taught wrong. I want to talk to you about man's fall into sin. Man's fall into sin. Now, most people would simply say, well, yeah, the devil kind of deceived them. And that's pretty much what we know about it. Uh, and that's how we end up in this mess. And that's what we know about the fall of man. But I want to try to help you here tonight. Let me start off by saying this. Sin did not start with man. Sin started with Lucifer. Now, don't ask me to explain how it happened in heaven and perfect surroundings in front of God. But actually, that's what happened in the garden. Perfect surroundings in the presence of God. Every night, as far as we know, they would walk in the cool of the evening, share things together. Perfect surrounding. How do you know it's perfect? No kids were there yet. And uh, so, and so that, and that's the truth. Okay. So what happened here is one day in heaven, God's mightiest angel, as far as we know, uh, by the name of Lucifer. Remember, his name was not Satan in heaven. He was not always Satan. When he was an archangel, his name was Lucifer. He, his name was changed to Satan because of the fall, all right? So you have to keep those things in mind. So Lucifer thought he could become as powerful, if not more mighty, than God himself. I want you to turn to, I told you, 2nd uh, and 3rd uh, Genesis, but I want you to go to Isaiah chapter 14, and we'll get started here. Isaiah chapter number 14. Isaiah chapter number 14. Again, there's some things in the Bible. I, I, well, there's a lot of things in the Bible I can't explain. Uh, one of them is why a person in perfect surroundings with a perfect husband and wife walking with God in the cool of evening and there was no sin, there was nothing to tempt them, why they would listen to anybody talk them out of that. I don't know, but I know it happened. Uh, the same thing in heaven. Uh, this person, this archangel named Lucifer, for some unknown reason, except we'll find the reasons here, uh, he wanted to be more than what God had designed him for. Now, that's really not unheard of even in the Bible. We come to find out during Moses' time, Korah did that. And Korah even brought to his attention and said, is it a small thing to you that God drew you to himself and give you this ministry? He, he, was, he was a top-notch helper, if you would, under Moses in, in the priesthood and in the taking care of the uh, tabernacle and all those kinds of things. And Moses just said, is this not enough that God called you to use you? Is that not enough? Oh, I know what you want. You want, if Moses would have said, he didn't say it this way, you want to be like me. You want my job. You want to be the leader and, and, and priest of God's people. So he wasn't satisfied with what God made him what God gave him, and that tends to be a temptation to a lot of us. So I want you to look in Ezekiel chapter 14, starting in verse number 4. Now there's a lot. What? I, I, what are we doing, fellas? They can't even hear me. What? Oh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14. Is that what you said? Who are you throwing your voice? There you go. Okay. You're doing well. Yeah, they're totally confusing me. They're saying things I never said in my life. I, Abigail, that's not funny. Isaiah 14, verse Isaiah 14, verse number 4. 4, can I have an amen? amen? Thank you very much. And thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruleth the nations 
in anger is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is, and, and is quiet. They break forth unto singing. Yea, the fir tree, trees rejoice at thee, the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee. Now understand, it sounds like he's talking to the king of, of, um, of um, we're talking Babylon here, but watch what he says. Hell from beneath is, uh, is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee. That sounds weird, doesn't it? Just awful. You're going to stir up the dead. Watch what he says here. Even all the chief ones of the earth, it hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become as weak as we? Now you've got all these kings, all these mighty people that are in hell, and they're saying, What happened to us? Happened to you? Now watch who they're talking about. They're talking about Satan. They're talking about Satan. And the kings of the earth are saying, Wait a minute, we're human beings. We were kings. This happened to you too? Watch what he says. Art thou become like unto us? Verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground that didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said, here's reason, for or because thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also upon the mount of the congregations in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Verse number 15. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly, not even paying much attention, look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake the, the kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of the prisoners? This is what happened to Lucifer when he was in heaven. And this is some of the things that were happening to him it kind of talking about prophecy here a little bit, where he began and what's going to happen. And he's looking at them saying, you're like the weakest of us now. We're in hell. You are too. You Are you the person that destroyed the world? Are you the one that brought ruin to all of this? They couldn't believe it. They narrowly looked upon him because he was nothing much to look at now. Had no powers all taken from him. He's being destroyed just like they are. And they couldn't believe it. But remember where he started off. Uh, now I want you to go to, ready for this, Ezekiel. Miss Bell, Ezekiel. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28. When he was in heaven and his name was Lucifer, my, my, my. What he was able to do because of what God put in him. By the way, there are things that God put into each one of us that God meant to be used for him and his glory. And if we are not careful, we're not using what God... So don't be looking at Satan like, how could he do that? How can we do this? Now, he was given all of this, but all that was expected out of him, and he failed. God put all that in us. and So, watch what the Bible says. Ezekiel 28, starting at verse number 13. Verse 13. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. God put heavenly music in Lucifer. Pipes, that's what he's talking about here. Pipes and t uh, tabrets and symbols and these kinds of things. Watch what he says in verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, that covered. 
and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast, thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created. Oh, here's his downfall. Till iniquity was found in thee. Everything was great. Beauty, music, light from the throne of God. He was the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the one, I don't know if that meant shelter or just beauty or whatever, but there he was before the throne of God. You wouldn't think anybody but God himself would say, this is more than I ever deserved, but he didn't. Okay, now before we get to say, yeah, how could he do that? Again, we have more than we deserve. And we rebel. Why do we have to do this? And how I could do better than this myself. I know what I'm doing. And Satan, that, that same rebellious attitude started in the garden. It didn't start there. It started in heaven. It started in heaven. So what do we see here? Verse 14, thou art anointed, the anointed cherub that covered, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. Uh, let's see how much farther I want to read this. And that's it right there. Now listen to me carefully. Lucifer was beautiful. Lucifer was for the throne of God, the almighty God. Every music, I, I can't, I try to imagine sometimes the wonderful music that sometimes you can hear from an orchestra or somebody really knows. I, I love acoustical guitar. Not, not that kind of stuff. I'm talking about when it's played properly. I mean, it is a beautiful sound, like piano. When a person really knows how to make a piano speak with music, gorgeous. Absolutely amazing. And the same thing here. That all started in heaven. Could you imagine the heavenly music that God put in him? Do you understand the beauty? Every precious diamond, ladies, you like diamonds? Pearls? Sapphires? Nice stuff, huh? All that was designed in heaven. You can imagine the music. And the light from God, that pure heavenly light shining on him. Could you imagine the rainbow you'd see then? There'd be more than six, seven, eight colors in that one. I was talking to, um, uh, what's the man's name? Frank Garlock. Garlock. Don't know if you know who that is. Uh, very, very intelligent, musical, great Christian. I had to sit with him one time and also with um, um, son of Juan Hamilton, we were up at First Baptist Church, and I said, can I ask you a question? He said, absolutely, ask me anything you want. I said, I was at the Smithsonian one time, and they showed a piano, and with every key, as far as they could, there were colors, like a rainbow. And I said, do you believe that color and music are actually resemble each other? There's absolutely no doubt about it. I said, Really? He said, the marvelous thing about it is our hearing and our eyes only go so far. But in heaven, that's not true. We say, oh, I bet it looked like the rainbow. I bet it was a lot more than that. I don't care the most heavenly, beautiful music you could possibly think of. Ooh, way beyond that. And right before the throne of God, you've got to get this picture. Because if not, we wonder sometimes why we don't go on with the Lord. Why, why did he cause all this problem? Well, he did cause it. It's amazing how we imitate him on our own level. And that just shouldn't be. What happened now, listen carefully, when, when, when Lucifer got kicked out and became Satan, he didn't lose any of the gifts that God gave him. He still controls as much music as he can. Music, in a lot of people's lives, worse than drugs. A lot of people quit drugs, they just can't give up their music. Everywhere you go in this world, just about there's music somewhere. Good, bad, or indifferent, there's music somewhere. And it tends to control us. A lot of people around the house, they just can't stand for it to be quiet. So they're always playing something in the background. Music of some kind, okay? Even in your movies and your commercial, all of it has music to it. But the devil has taken that which God perfected in him and brought it down and perverted it, which means changing it to mislead. Okay, you understand? Listen up here, girls, look at me. And so they're doing all of this. And the same thing with his beauty. 
Bible said, marvel not that the devil be transformed into an angel of light. Why? It's what he was. And his ministers, those who follow and do his bidding, if you would, into ministers of righteousness. So he said, don't let, this, don't, don't let this throw you. So we find out here that he was very beautiful, great, great music. What an understatement. And right before the throne of God. That, that's where he started. And we find out in Isaiah where his end is going to be. In the pits of hell. At the end of the sixth day, if you'll go there, go to Genesis chapter number 1. Genesis chapter number 1. Now, I can't absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, tell you when Lucifer fell from heaven. I, I, honestly, I've read different um, supposings, uh, I thinks, uh, commentaries of he fell a long time ago and destroyed the earth and God had to remake it. Okay, whatever. Uh, or I tend to believe, now here's the reason why. Watch, here's what I think. Here's what I think. I cannot understand what I just said. Here's what I think. I didn't say it was Bible. Here's what I think, and here's the reason why. Look in, in chapter number 1, verse 31. And God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Now, that was the sixth day. After that, God rested. Work was done. Didn't mean he was worn out. Just mean, I'm done. Okay? And so he rested. There's no more work to be done. Everything he wanted to do, he already did. So we find out here, he said it was very good. I think immediately, right after creation, it's just what I think. I, I can't necessarily prove this other than statements like this. God said at the end, he said it was very good. I like what I've done. What was he talking about? He was talking about not just the garden, but the world that he had made. And with all that being said, I don't think that Lucifer was down here yet. Now, understand, or had access to the world yet. He's not down here yet. But we'll come, I'll show you that in a minute. But what happened was, I believe that Lucifer rebelled in heaven and then was kicked out of heaven, still has access to heaven, still has access to earth. But he's not down on the earth yet. Not in form, if you would. He still has access to heaven, and he still has access to uh, literally, one day he'll be cast down to the earth. Right now, he has access down here, and he has access. It sounds to me like when the angels or the messengers of God get together and come before God, he shows up there. Maybe by invitation, I don't know. Turn to Revelation chapter number 12. Revelation chapter number 12. There will be a day. We, we sometimes say the devil's been on my case all week. We're really not that important. There are demons and spirits and other devils. The Bible refers to them as demons. Um, that uh, he has bigger fish to fry, if you would. Uh, and so, uh, like Jesus, Paul, people like that, um, you'll find out even when the sons of Sceva tried to cast out demons, the devil didn't show up. The demons were plenty strong enough to handle them. And so watch what happens here in Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So we find out when Lucifer was kicked out of heaven, it appears as though about one-third of the angels for some reason followed him. And they all got cast out. Some of them were cast into hell immediately, and others are spirits and still have access in this world. Please remember, they work through people. Okay, they work through people. That's why when uh, you'll find out uh, um, the maniac of Gadara, he said, don't, don't, don't cast us out. Let's stay in this place. And, okay, you don't have any body to make us go into. Send us in the pigs. Why not just float around and go where you want to? Because they're corporate beings. They have to have a body uh, or incorporate. Corporate, incorporate. Corporate, okay. Okay, so watch what happens here. Verse number uh, 8. And prevailed not. So we have this battle going on in heaven between Michael and, and his angels. He has some that are assigned to him. And the, and the, and the uh, dragon and his angels, and they're fighting back and forth. This is what we see in Daniel when Daniel's praying for 21 days, and the answer couldn't come through. Michael and Gabriel finally had to fight. I think they were fighting Satan himself. 
in the atmosphere above us. Okay, not down here. They were not down here. And so this is going on. Remember, uh, angels are messengers of God for God's people. All right? So what's happened here is this. And prevailed not. Neither was place found for them anymore in heaven. Not the heaven. In heaven. And the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which did accuse them night and day. So now he's, in this time, cast down to the earth itself. Right now, somewhere, he still has access to heaven. I don't know how often or when, and he has access to the earth. So he still is kind of like running back and forth or whatever. But there will be a day when he becomes actually embodied in someone here on this planet. The devil himself, the mightiest archangel that ever lived, now becomes Satan, will incorporate a body and walk upon this earth. And he will become the king. He will become the God. The Bible says he's the God of this world. And so this is kind of what's going on right now. After God created mankind, Satan decided to use man to rebel against God. He tried to rebel against God. That didn't work. God kicked him right on out of there. And so now he comes down here, and the first thing he does is go after mankind. So this is this is what we're leading to right now. Man does not need to uh, go to um, – uh, where am I at here? Oh, okay. Satan cannot overthrow God, never will. Understand, we're talking God Almighty, created being. We're not talking about two gods. Now, on this earth, he's referred to as small g, the God of this world. But there's only one God Almighty. And so God created him. He is a created being. He will never be a God. There is not this eternal struggle between God. There is an eternal struggle, right? Well, not eternal, between man and Satan but not between God and Satan. And so here's what happens here. Watch it very carefully. So we find out here uh, Satan attacks God's favorite creature. It's not the animals, ladies. It's not the trees. It's not the cats. We all know where they're going. It's man. It's man. Satan came to this earth and attacked man. Now, I want you to go. When God created the Garden of Eden, he placed only one tree which Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat. One. One tree. Now, I have no idea how large Eden was. I know there were three rivers that came out of there. I know there's one that's still represented even today. It's the Euphrates River. Now, where it started and where it ended up, that I don't know. I think after the flood, everything changed. Everything changed. But we do find out here this tree, go to Genesis chapter number 2. This tree was called, as you know this much, okay, the tree of what is it called? The tree of what? Knowledge, huh? The tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge of, ready, good and evil. Not just good, not just evil. Good and evil. So we find out in Genesis chapter number 2, look at verse number 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest eat, freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou shalt in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. This tree was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Man does not need to know evil. Man needed to know good, and he did know good. I want you to turn, if you would, please, to Romans chapter 16. Even in the New Testament, when it comes to knowing, here's what we're doing today. My kids need to know what all is going on in the world so they'll know how to do right. No, that's backward, totally backward. Go to Romans chapter number uh, 16. Romans chapter number 16. And look, if you would, please, at verse number 19. Paul's talking to those at Corinth, and they're getting out of line. And here's what he says to them in one statement. Verse number 19, For your obedience is come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. 
We do not need to know. I want my kids to know what's going on in the world so they won't fall for it. No, if you know what's right and do that, you won't fall for it. Uh, they don't do it anymore, but uh, in, in banks, I believe, Miss Miriam and other people might be able to help me out there. We used to have a lady that came here, her name was Sarah, that worked in a bank. And so I asked her one day about this. I heard somebody say the way you figure out what's counterfeit is by knowing what's good. When you go to a banker somewhere, if they follow procedures, it'll be obvious what's wrong. Does that make sense? Sure it does. So I don't need to, look, they're always out there trying to figure out some way to get around. If I had to study all that out and stay up with it, I'd never get anything done except finding out who's trying to get over. What I need to know is what's proper procedure, and I don't need to worry about that. You understand? So counterfeiting, what they used to do, and funny money, as they call it, they would simply say, paper's different, ink's different, the print is different. It has a different feel. You say, how do you keep up with all that? Well, the uh, mint is always changing things. They put little strips in there now, and they put um, different types of printing. And uh, what do you call that when you look at things? What is it? Watermark. All kinds of stuff they've done in that because of the counterfeiting. And so you say, how do you keep up with that? Don't need to. What they do back then, I don't know what they do now. They would simply put you in a place where you handle all right types of money. And then when you count it out, you just, that don't feel right. That don't look right. Something's wrong. What alerted you? The good. That's why Paul said, I would rather that you were wise unto that which is good and ignorant unto that which is evil. You don't need to, okay, now let's go back to the garden. What was it that Satan tempted her with, knowing what? Good and evil. She didn't need. They already knew all the good they needed to know. So he played on the fact of, ready, education, knowledge. Knowledge, what a big throwdown that is. This desire for knowledge has destroyed much of mankind and has taken them from God. Knowledge doesn't hardly ever take people closer to God. You ever tried to witness to somebody's highly educated? I'm glad we don't have anybody like that in here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seriously, it's like they're too smart for their own good. Somebody called me one day. Actually, it was from uh, Brother Manning's church, I believe. And uh, they've been trying to witness to this uh, highly educated couple. And he, preacher, he lives right around the corner. Would you mind going talk to us? I'd love to. And look, uh, they're big on, on, on uh, evolution, and they love to argue about stuff. I said, I'll go by. I went by there four or five times. They weren't home. Then finally made an appointment. We'll go to talk to them. When I walked in, they were already waiting. They had a laptop set up and all kinds of stuff, along with about 24 empty bottles of beer. Kids were running wild, and I mean wild. I don't mean just my standard. I mean they're running over stuff, knocking things down, screaming, yelling, beating the tar out of each other. And mom and dad are so intelligent, they don't even realize what's going on. So I sat down. Boy, we're glad you come by. So I'm glad to come by. So they want to talk about evolution. They went on and 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 on. I said, huh, what do you say? I said, oh, you have two problems. What's that? I said, well, first of all, do you know the, uh, the Biloxi River, Paloxi River in Texas? If there are millions of years difference between dinosaurs and man, how is it possible in the same layer of bedrock that they found a man's footprint and a dinosaur's footprint? He never read that part. I said, the other thing is, you've only studied what you want. You've never studied the Bible and true facts of real science, or at least to try to compare them. He didn't know what to say again. So when all that was done, he said, we love to argue. Man, we hope you come back. and We, we need to argue some more. You know what I told him? I said, I'll discuss the Bible with you, but I don't argue with people. They never came to church. They never got saved as far as I know. And so what they were doing, their knowledge, knowledge puffeth up. There's nothing wrong with knowledge, but we are warned that it puffeth up. So in Romans, we find that out. The desire for knowledge has destroyed a lot of people. Do you know where Amos is? Go to Amos. Okay. You know where Jonah, Hosea, right in that area. Got it? Right after Joel. You got it? Piece of cake. Look in Amos chapter number 5. 
Amos chapter number 5. And verse number 14 and 15. Again, reiterating, you do not need to know everything that's going on in the world. That's what TV has done. That's what AI is doing. That's what Google is doing. That's what all these things are doing, is getting us to know everything going on in the world. I thought the Bible said all that's in the world. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life is not of the Father. So it just keeps force-feeding us. Now, we willingly keep eating of the tree of knowledge and can't understand why we don't have a good relationship with God. We even read the Bible and go, I don't get it. Why does it have to be that way? Because the world has been teaching us what it wants. We're learning all this evil, right? Okay, politics. I don't want to know any more about that. How do you know that? You've been listening. Watch. Seek good, verse 14, and not evil. There you go again, Old Testament. That you may live. And so the Lord, the God of heaven, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate evil. Hate it. Love the good. And he talked about establishing judgment and so on and so forth. So the reiteration is that we're so afraid that our kids would do wrong. So we're telling them, look, see, that's a bad situation. Now let me tell you a story about somebody that did something wrong. How about this? How about teaching them the Bible? The Bible uses a word called discernment. Discernment is using God's word of instruction and understanding on how to make proper decisions in everyday situations. Not just in church, everyday situations. That's what a discernment is. So we find out here in Proverbs, God tells us to seek after wisdom and knowledge. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 1, it's not telling us to stay ignorant. Go there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. First Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 1. Now, this, this has everything to do with what happened in the garden. Watch very carefully. Now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up. Charity edifieth. He's not saying stay ignorant because knowledge is a bad thing. He is simply stating a fact. Knowledge puff, gives you the big head. Do you know where I went to school? Somehow we use that as a lording over other people. And it, it really shouldn't be that way. Now, you should have respect for people. They put in the time. They paid for it. They earned it. Have respect for people. But at the same time, when a person uses their knowledge as a, they're puffed up. There's nothing wrong with knowledge, but very few people handle it very well. So we find out here. Now, let's go back to Genesis chapter number 3. Okay, we're going up there in a minute. Genesis chapter number 3. So in 1 Corinthians, we find out that knowledge puffeth up. Again, reiterating, it's not wrong, but you better be very, very careful about what knowledge does to people. So does it surprise us now that the devil came to Eve, guess with what? Knowledge. Of what? Good and evil. Not just evil. He didn't come to her and say, hey, you want a needle? You want to shoot up? Huh? He didn't come to her and say, you want a drink? Man, it's a bottle of whiskey. Man, it's good for everybody. God just didn't. He didn't do that. He deceived. You know what he did? Look up here. He took God's perfectly preserved, accurate, non-contradictory word that God told them, gave them a direct command, so no misunderstanding. And he added one small phrase. Eve fell for it. Look in chapter number 3, chapter number 3, and verse number 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle. Subtle means cunning, crafty, okay? Subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Now, see, he's, he's, he's playing dumb to find out who the smart ones are. That I, I use that phrase. In other words, he knew better. Did God, God say you want He knew. He knew. But watch what happened. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. No period. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat it. Uh-oh. He never said that. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. He did not say lest you touch it. He didn't say that. The devil had her. This is the importance of the King James Bible. 
look, it, what's the big deal? It means the same thing. Well, he used one phrase, and all of mankind ended up in sin. Watch what happens here. So what? And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. Now he's contradicting what God said. God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be, uh, shall be open, and ye shall be as... Ooh, now that's tempting. Now, when you think of God, you think creating God Almighty. Um, a, a God, small g, is someone who knows what they want, take command of their life, make their own decisions, don't have to depend on anybody. That's what a God does. We always want that. We're at the place now, they're saying less and less people see the need of church or God or Bible than ever before in our history. You know why? We're our own gods. We know what we want. We know what we like. We know the future we're supposed to have. We know all these things. Guess where all this started? Right there, okay? And the devil knew it. By the way, he was kind of that way in heaven. So watch what happens here. So what happens here is simply this. Man has a will. Man has a will. The Bible does not teach total predestination of the human race. It was Adam's choice. Adam made a choice. Now listen to me very carefully. The devil cannot make you sin. God will not force you to obey and behave. You have a will. You can choose. But here's what we say. No, it was overwhelming. I couldn't help myself. Not true. It may have seemed that way. Like Eve right here. She got talked into it. I mean, what's she supposed to do? Well, I could tell you a lot of things she should have done. But what happened was this. Why would God chastise total predestination? I'm going to talk to you about that in just a moment. Why would God chastise me if I couldn't choose? What kind of a just father would that be? I didn't have a choice, and you're, you're going to chastise me, kick me out of the garden, and tell me I had to do all this the rest of my life? What kind of a God would do that? Why would why why the whosoever's in the Bible? If there's absolute predestination, I'll explain to you what I mean by that in a minute. We do not believe in, here's something you may want to write down, it's called hyper-Calvinism. It is entering back into Baptist churches, from what I understand, like wildfire. This is why I do not allow you or anybody to pass out what you want. It's as dangerous as a young Christian going, hey, I went to this bookstore and I'm looking for this good book. They don't even realize what they're doing. Eve was in a perfect surrounding and somebody said, maybe you want to read that book there. Maybe you want to take a bite out of that thing right there. Let her right into it. Next thing you know, she's in big trouble. So I want you to look at this, if you would, please. We don't have handouts, but we have this. Very good. Mike did all that for me. I appreciate that very much. The way you remember what hyper-Calvinism is, there is an acrostic that they use, TULIP. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but a lot of people say we have no choice in the matter. Uh, that we are, uh, we are uh, irresistible grace. And so watch it carefully. Tulip stands for T, total depravity, which is true. Man is totally depraved. There is nothing good in us. There's none good, no, not one. Bible says that. After the fall of man, there's nothing good in us. I know what you may think about yourself, but the Bible teaches the opposite. After the fall of man, we became totally depraved. Hyper-Calvinism starts off with that. Number two, unconditional election. What did that mean? Well, some are just elected to go to heaven and some are elected to go to hell. That's just the way that this is all false teaching. So don't look at me and go, I didn't know that. No, this is false. Okay? What he's saying is, well, what, let's just go on. L, limited atonement. Only so many are going to be saved and that's it. Aren't we glad we're one of them? Right? Well, I guess I made it. That's like Jehovah's Witnesses talking about the 144,000. And you ask them, are you one of those? Things? I don't know. You mean after all these decades, you've never reached 144,000 yet? Pretty sad. So limited atonement, only so many people are going to be saved. Aren't you glad you got in? 
But this is what he taught. Now, there's a lot of detail on why he says that. Then irresistible grace. You have no choice. Those chosen cannot resist salvation and living for God. You cannot resist it. You're going to no matter what. Again, no will. No will whatsoever. And then perseverance of the saints. Now, we do need to persevere. But what Calvin meant by that was once you're saved, once you're truly saved, you'll continue doing good works and believing in God until the very day you die. You have no choice in the matter. You'll do it. Unconditional. Every bit of this except maybe the first one is wrong. And so one way to remember that is Tula. Now what this does, watch very carefully. Let's go back to the garden. It takes away the need of witnessing to people. Actually, that's what they'll teach you. I don't know why you people go door to door. God's going to save who he wants to save. And other than that, they're not getting saved. So why do you keep doing that? So no matter what you read in the Bible, there's no witnessing to lost people. It won't do you a bit of good. That's not true. Number two, it takes away the will of man about salvation. Actually, it takes away man's will, period. You have no choice in the matter. This is what's going to happen, whether you like it or not. You're staying saved because if you're truly saved, you can't get out. It's unconditional. So there's a lot of things here. It takes away chastisement of Christians when we sin and do things that are wrong. It takes away the loss and gains of rewards that you read in the Bible. It does away with a lot of Bible when you start believing it. Now, the reason I'm telling you about this is because that's what a lot of people will say happened to Adam and Eve. It was predestined for them to do this. What do we mean by, you say, preacher, I read the word predestined in the Bible, predestinated in the Bible, predestination. You know, you have. And then we run off and start thinking of all kinds of stuff that somebody has suggested. The Bible says we are predestined, ready for the rest of it, to be conformed to the image of his son. God said the reason I made man so you can be like my son. Predestined. We are predestined unto good works once we're saved. God said, I designed you for good works. God didn't say, well, you know, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you, whatever. No, that part was predestined. There is the universal will of God that's going to take place. But when it comes to man and salvation, salvation is what God came up with. Man needs that. God gave you a will. So now we're back to the garden. Adam and Eve had a will, a brain a decision maker. And I hate to say this, but they made the wrong decision. The devil in the form of a serpent, please understand again, go back to Genesis chapter number, well, no, we're getting ready to go to Timothy. In the form of a serpent, the devil was not a serpent. Unless you mean a, no, he wasn't even that. He he came into the form of a serpent. Now, there's some surprising things about this. Eve is walking through the garden or standing around, painting her nails. I don't know what she was doing. And all of a sudden, this serpent starts talking to her. The Bible does not indicate any surprise, shock, what's going on, which leads me, along with some other scripture, that animals talked. There was no curse on the earth. No curse on animals, no curse on the earth, no curse on man, no curse on the woman, no curse on Lucifer, the devil, none. The sixth day, God saw everything was good. We're good to go. Now, what happened? All of a sudden, what happened was this. The Bible says in Genesis that the devil entered into the form. Go to chapter number 3, verse number 1 through 3. See again here? Watch what happens here. Um, Go to verse 4. And the serpent, uh, no, don't go to verse number 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. And uh, go down to verse number 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, we find out later on when the Lord uh, passed judgment on everybody, it was the devil had entered into the form of the serpent. And part of his punishment was that he will crawl on his belly. I thought that's what serpents did. Snakes do that, right? They crawl on that. That's part of the curse for being used by the devil. By the way, part of our curse, fellas, you're supposed to be working by the sweat of your brow. Ladies, Part of your curse, twofold, pain and childbearing. That part's true, right? How about the next part? Remember the next part? 
and your husband shall lord over you. We believe that first part. <coughs> that second part, pure evil. The devil, in the form of a serpent, tempted Eve to eat the fruit. Eve was deceived into sinning. She still sinned, but she was tricked into it. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 2. I want you to look at verse number 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Well, I just don't think that's I think that's old-fashioned. I don't know why we have to do it. Well, he's going to explain. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority, not everywhere, over a man. And he tells you why. Ready? But to be in silence. Why? For or because. See, you're staring at me because I'm cute. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Look at your Bible. Learn your Bible. For Adam, verse 13, was first formed, then Eve. That's one reason. God made him first. Number two, Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Eve was deceived. Adam sinned knowing full well what he was doing. Eve got talked into it or deceived by the deceiver, and she fell for it because she would not go and talk to her husband, and she didn't go by what saith the word of God. God told her, don't eat it. But she did it anyway. And you'll find out she did not have a conversation with her husband, did not have a conversation with God, and started adding to God's word. And the next thing you know, we're in big trouble. So what we find out here is in, uh, uh, where are we at here? Yeah, Second Timothy. Why did Satan come to the woman first? Isn't that a good question? Why did he come to her first? Listen very carefully. To get to the man. Ladies, please listen. Who was deceived who was not deceived, but sinned. He went to the weaker vessel by design. Now, I know you're a modern woman. You can pump iron, and you're as smart as any man, and you can fry it up in a pan, and you can, I mean, you can do everything. Then why in the world would God talk like this? He didn't say, except you knowledgeable ladies, you graduated from college ladies, you business ladies. He didn't say that. I want you to go to First Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter number 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse number 7. 1 Peter chapter number 7. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now, when it says here that in, in verse number 8, he said, um, no, verse number 7, he's saying here, give honor to live with according to knowledge. You're the one that's supposed to be teaching and training your wife. This is why we're not on the same page about it. We live together for economic reasons. We live together for sexual reasons. We live together for social reasons. But very few people live together to successfully live and bring honor to God. Because in order to do that, I need to know my position. She knows the, her, her position. I also need to keep learning and then teach my wife. Because we are heirs together. Adam and Eve were heirs together. And the devil came at the woman and said, if I'm going to ever get to the man, and if I'm ever going to injure God, I've got to get to the woman because she is the weaker vessel. He knew that. He knew that, and that's what happened here. So we find out even in the garden, the woman is a help meet. Not a help mate, not a helper. Go, go if you would, please. Go back to, to Genesis chapter number 2 or 3. I didn't even write this part down. Yeah, there we go. That's one of them. Yeah. This is what I also use when people get married. 
which you weren't thinking about this because you were busy staring at each other, thinking about what's going to happen later that night. Verse number 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that he should be alone. I will make him a, what's the next two words? Help me. That's not a hyphenated word. It's not help mate. It's not a typo. It means exactly what it says, a help meet for him. You are a help meet for him. Made for him. You're not made for yourself. You're not here to help yourself. You're here to help him. What a high, exalted position that God gave. See, we act like that's... No, no, look what God did. God said, I made this perfect man, and I am going to make you specifically to help that guy. We all love our dogs. Do you know why? Because they do what they're told. And they're so friendly. You scratch behind the ear, they kick. Right? You feed them, you get them to obey, they do everything, right? Because they're in subjection. They're doing what they're taught to do. You have a pit bull that wants to attack everybody, you taught them. You didn't teach them to do right, and then you encouraged them to do wrong. A lot of guys go off to work, they do all they want to do, and you forgot all about your help meet. Lady, I don't know how we did this. Children come before mom and dad anymore. The woman comes before the man anymore. And Jesus said, hey, man, we'll try to work him in somewhere. I don't know how we got to be that way, but we are, right? We wait on the woman. We, we dote on the woman. We give things to the woman. I'm not necessarily against that, but we have reversed these whole roles anymore. She is a help meet for you. No place in the Bible does it say the other way around. You, you go to other countries, and you're going to find out. Yeah, the woman kind of waits on the man. And the children, do what you're told, stay out of the way. Only in America. And we want to teach the whole world what we do here. I hope we never do. And so what happens here? You're going to find out here women are not to be in places of authority where they are likely to mislead men. Let me give you an example. We come to find out that there are cults which are led by women and designed and started by women. Ellen G. White. Seventh day Adventist. That whole thing was started by a woman. Wrote all these books, misleading thousands and thousands of men, teaching women and men, which the Bible clearly says don't. You cannot usurp authority over men. So today, they're not usurping. We're giving them. Oh, I love sitting underneath that woman preacher. Boy, does she help me a lot. What in the world happened to you? You're not better than her, but the Bible clearly says no. How about this? How about uh, Seventh-day Adventist, Mary Baker Eddy? I'm sorry, Ellen G. White, Seventh-day Adventist, Mary Baker Eddy. Christian science. Christian science, started by a woman. Started by a woman. The Fox Sisters Spiritism. You say, I never heard of these people. They are women who usurped authority and now are misleading millions of people, men included, because they don't know their place. I'm sorry, the man did not, they don't know their place. Go to Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 6. Many charismatic churches, think about it. Who's some of the greatest preachers on TV now? And I'll tell you something about men. Buddy, when I was married and the man that I had, and you know, they just go on and on and go, wow. What a revelation. Boy, that is really good. Oh, they write books you can't wait. Some of you men probably have them in your library. What's that What's that big mouth woman? Who? Joyce Myers. Oh, I'm telling you, does she know her Bible? Well, if she did, she wouldn't be preaching and teaching men. I'd love to meet her husband. I don't think he ever showed that guy, did he? Maybe he didn't ever want to be seen. I don't know. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 6. Watch what happens here. And when the woman saw, now understand, the devil is coming right at her. He's not forcing anything. He's not chopping down the tree and letting it fall on her. He's not force-feeding her. He's leading her. I thought that was the husband's job. Satan's leading her to where he wants her to go. And she's following. Because she has something in her brain 
I'm, I want to I want to know more. I want to be more than what I am. But yeah, why would God keep this away from us? Watch what happens. Verse six. You're already reading anyway. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, God never said it wasn't good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eye. God never said it wasn't pleasant to the eye. And a tree desired to make one wise, and that is true. Here's what she messed up. She took of the fruit and did eat. Right there is when she sinned. And gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. Verse number seven. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig. Now they're trying to cover things up. Why? You disobeyed God. Isn't that what we do? We try to cover things up. Watch what happens here. And that made aprons and and, uh, made them for themselves. They're trying to hide it. Verse number eight. And they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and Eve, that's the first time that ever happens. They hid themselves. I believe a lot of people aren't in church for that very reason. They They don't want God talking to them. And you know how he comes to them? I'm, I'm here. Come on, let's talk again. Come on. It's not like, I'm here, what happened? He didn't do that. If you can know much about God, his heart was broken. His perfect creation has sinned. It happened in heaven. Now, that creature brought it down to my created beings, and we're going to go through this. So watch what happens here hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. Isn't that sad? Is this not what we do when we sin? We hide things. We hide us. We wish we were hid. And God comes looking for us, doesn't he? No matter what you've done, you're in church. God came looking for you. We, we still think there's some goodness in us. Now, to be honest, I changed my mind. And really, Lord, well, aren't you just a Godhead? No, we're not. So watch what happens here. And the Lord called unto Adam and said, this is a very sad phrase. Adam, where are you? It's time, Adam. It's time for our walk. Come on, come on. Let's get together now. Like we always, where are you at? God already knew. You know what Adam was doing? He didn't run to be with God. He missed his appointment with God. It's probably on a Sunday night during church time. I'm just saying. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid. That's a first two. There's a lot of firsts going on in there. Because I was naked, I hid myself. That wasn't the reason why. And he says, who told you you were naked? Who, who told you? You never noticed it before. You see, innocence is kind of that way. Hast thou, God knew right off the bat, didn't he? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee? that thou? God's not mad. God is hurt. I told you what would happen. Watch what happens here. Who told this in verse number 12? And the man said, and this is what we do. We start blaming people. Adam blamed God for the gift he gave him. You know the woman you gave me? She did it. Isn't that what he said? And the man said, the woman whom thou gavest to me, she gave to the tree and I did eat. She did it. Well, sure she did. Adam, you knew better. Whether she offered it to you or not. And this is the problem we've always had with husbands leading their families. And when somebody in the family makes a wrong decision, you change your mind about walking with God and go with them. This is nothing new, what happens today. Well, if you're going to live for God like that, I'm leaving you. Okay, then I'm leaving God too. Now, we don't say God. We say church. We say that preacher. So they begin to blame each other. And the Lord said unto the woman, what is it that thou hast done? And the woman blamed somebody else. But it was true. And the serpent said, I'm sorry, and the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and that's true. And I did eat, and that was true. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above all the beasts of the field, and upon thy belly shalt thou go. And thus shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Just by being used like that. Understand, Satan is not a serpent. He went into the serpent and used it. Like some of your friends. 
oh, yeah, they're the best friends. They're not saved. They don't know the Lord. They don't give you good advice from the Bible. God said don't take counsel from the ungodly. But they're nice people. They, haven't, they don't hurt anybody. Well, then Satan came to him and said like this, I like this place. This is really nice. How long have you lived here? Oh, three days. Great. I like this place. He set her up. And the Bible says she returned, gave to her husband. And he did eat. So we find out here this wasn't going very good. How the heart of God was broken. His perfect creatures had chosen, chosen to disobey. She was deceived, but she made a decision. Adam sinned. He made a decision. They chose to do that. God warned them that if they disobeyed, they would die. From that day on, they begin to age. Okay, it took them like 900 years, but they got older. They got older. We're hoping without God that we'll end up being able with science and medicine to live to be as old as Methuselah. You know, if you take care of yourself and you take vitamins and you exercise and drink 40 gallons of water a day, you, you know, you can have a lot better. Well, you, really? You think you're going to live for like, what, 150 or something? I read about a guy lived to be 110. One guy out of billions. And you think you're going to be that guy. I can't believe the things that we do anymore. From that day forward, they aged. But spiritually, they died immediately because of disobedience. Christian, listen to me. If you stop and think about it, you know what it's like to be out of touch with God when you sin. Communication is broken. You can sit in church all you want to and hear and listen, but you're not getting anything. Every time preacher mentions certain words, guilt sets in. I'm not just talking hurt. I'm talking about guilt. You just wish you could kind of I'll mask it. I'll hide it. Hello, preacher. Oh, couldn't be any better. Until the preacher starts preaching. And the same thing with God walking in the garden. Adam ran from God right after sin entered. Right after. God came that night and said, Adam, Adam, where are you at? Um, hiding. Why? Did you partake of the tree? Eve was all set. I want you to show one thing. Go to verse number 5, chapter 3. You shall not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open. Oh, they were definitely open to a lot of stuff they had no business looking at. They never even saw this stuff till their eyes were open. And ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. world is just flooding us with evil. And we just keep staring at it. We're tempted by it. We actually want to reach out and grab it because, you know, it's going to make us smarter. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back to college and learn some more. Now, everybody else is going to pay for it. But I'm going to learn some more. And we just keep going on because we know every commercial and every college tells you that education is the next level for you that will get you up where you need to be. I'm not encouraging ignorance by long shot. The Bible warns about it, puffeth up. Spiritually, they died. Adam ran from God after sin entered in, just as sinners do today. God, who was their creator and their very key word, friend. The friend. God was their friend. Had to drive his creation out of his presence. This is what happened and why Jesus had to come. Our sins and iniquities have separated between us and our God. Who in the world is going to bridge that gap? I want you to go, if you would, please. Go to, um, uh, I think this is Genesis. Uh, go to Genesis 22. Uh, Genesis 3, 22. Imagine how I built a garden, perfect in every way, one command not to do. We'll talk in the garden. We'll enjoy each other. I made you a help meet one just like you. Boy, Adam, you're so smart. You can name all the animals. Man did not start off stupid, dragging his knuckles, pulling his wife around by the hair. You better watch watching all of these earth documentaries. Wow, guess what they found out the other day? And you just take it for granted. Well, that must be true. 
I don't ever do that. I don't care what, what I'm watching as far as Bible stuff, history stuff, man stuff. Not me, buddy. I just bounce it right off the Bible. That's a stupid. Who come up with that? You go like this. Wow. Guess what they just found out? And we, we go for it, okay? And so watch what happens here. Go to verse number 22. Chapter number 3, verse 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us. In, in what way? To know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat. And he would live forever that way. That was never God's plans for man to live forever, knowing good and evil. And God said, I can't let this happen. You go back in that garden and partake of that. You're going to live forever with that kind of mind. Watch what he says. Therefore, because of that, God, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Now, before you get to thinking, man, why haven't they discovered that? You forgot about the flood. After the flood, everything changed. The whole face of the earth changed. So we find out here, Satan thought he had won. But even in the garden, God said, you ain't winning. This should never have happened. You're not winning, bud. Watch it. We're almost done here. Go to Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. Genesis chapter 3, verse number 15. While he's talking to them and part of the curse of the woman, look, if you would, please, at verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the servant, Because thou hast done this, thou cursed above every... Be- go to... Uh, where do I want to go here? Uh, verse number 12. No, that's not it. 15, there you go. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman. The woman. And between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise it, the woman's seed. Medical terms, you never talk about the woman's seed. But what else was God supposed to say? He didn't have a dad. This is foretelling of Jesus Christ going to come. And what's going to happen? Watch what he says here. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Satan, as soon as Jesus died on that cross and rose from the dead, is sealed. He's done. I mean, in in God's terms, it was already done. Good is done. But it actually took place when he got up. He rose over death, hell, and the grave. He went in and led captivity captive. Jesus did all of this as if to say, told you. And I will redeem mankind back to me. And that's what he did. So we find out here, and that also mentions something like that in Isaiah chapter 714. Adam and Eve sinned. We're all sinners. Understanding Genesis has a lot to do with understanding what's going on in our lives. Marriage, children, the fall of man, sin, redemption, shedding of blood, the whole thing. We must be careful even after we get saved not to fall to the devil's devices. Let's pray. Father, thank you for